I want to address all sides of the ideological spectrum for a moment and hope we can all agree on a few facts. Over the last 200 years, surely we can agree that coal and oil have taken the world from a patchwork of backward rural economies through the Industrial Revolution into the modern age. I used to work as a geologist on oil exploration rigs in the Mediterranean and the North Sea and helped find the fossil fuels that had given you and me all the comforts we now enjoy. Like it or not, that is the economic reality. But we also have to acknowledge the fact that burning these fuels has caused problems like pollution, bad health, and above all raised the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to the point at which it's causing global warming. Like it or not, that's the scientific reality. We're led to believe that the two sides of this debate are those who say the only way to deal with anthropogenic climate change is to dismantle the capitalist system, and those who want to pretend it's all a hoax. I think the majority of sensible people would like to deal with the problem and support the free market system. Normally I wouldn't tackle a subject like this, but I need to address the messages I get every time I make a video about science, suggesting that accepting science is an indication that I must be left-wing, as if all conservatives must be scientifically illiterate, or that science and capitalism are incompatible. So forgive me for spending a couple of videos on how climate science relates to the world of politics and economics. I'll put that away, this whole video is my opinion. But it's going to be an opinion based on facts, and as always, my sources are cited in the video description. I want to show why I think science, a healthy environment, and free enterprise are all essential elements of our democratic way of life and I want you to meet some of the entrepreneurs and inventors I've met as a science reporter who are leading an energy revolution. But first, how did climate science suddenly become a political issue? After all, the link between carbon dioxide and temperature has been accepted by research scientists since it was first discovered in 1896 and confirmed in the 1940s. But the problem was largely confined to the scientific community until a visionary politician, who really understood the science, spoke out on the world stage and, for the first time, gave us this stark warning. I spoke about the global threat of climate change. I set out the magnitude of the challenge we face. Until recently, we've always thought that whatever progress humanity makes, our planet would stay much the same. That may no longer be true. Next month, I shall be going to the United Nations to set out our view on how the world should tackle climate change. We've proposed a global convention, a sort of good conduct guide to the environment for all the world's nations, on problems like the greenhouse effect. Britain has taken the lead internationally and we shall continue to do so. Yes, it was a staunch conservative, the Iron Lady herself, who gave a series of speeches on global warming 17 years before Al Gore turned it into a movie. To those who say Margaret Thatcher later rescinded her position, no, she didn't. She has a degree in analytical chemistry, so she was no dummy. She never contradicted the science. What she criticised was the way climate change was being used by a few extremists as an excuse to attack the capitalist system. The problem is that in the United States, powerful lobby groups have taken this to mean that anyone who accepts the science must therefore be a member of this nutty anti-capitalist fringe group. That's why there's very little room in the USA for the voices of intelligent, free-thinking conservatives who do accept the science. If you want to carve out a career as a conservative pundit in the USA, you have to repeat the politically correct talking points. The idea that the Arctic ice is disappearing is nonsense. Uh, the idea that the hockey stick graph is anything remotely resembling reality. That's why they call it climate change now and not global warming, because the, the Earth basically has not been warming for the last 15 years Okay, I'm not here so. to debunk all these internet myths. I've done that in previous videos, and so have many others. It's not hard to fact-check, so there has to be a reason why Ben Shapiro is so willing to repeat these myths. Well, what Shapiro says next gives us a very revealing clue. All of which is to say, if you could come up with a solution 
that did not hurt millions of people and plunge us back into the 1850s, then maybe we could talk about it. So it's not really the science Ben has a problem with. It's his fear that those who accept the link between CO2 and global temperature have some sort of agenda and want to plunge us back to the 1850s. So he's only willing to accept the science if there's an acceptable solution. And he's not alone. China, India, U.S. factories, cars, coal energy plants and Hummers, not those Hummers, are generating only 3% of the Earth's CO2. Again, I've already shown why this particular fallacy is wrong. It even made it onto my list of top 10 climate myths. So that's not the point here. Far more interesting is why Penn Jillette feels the need to regurgitate myths like this. And in more pensive mood, he tells us. I am not sure that all the tenets of global warming are true. It seems pretty likely things are getting warmer. It seems pretty likely it was anthropogenic in some way. But then there comes this whole bill of goods that, that it has to be done by conservation, it has to be done by government intervention, and has to be all this done. And I was just saying that the whole package... I didn't know about. So, as with Ben Shapiro, it's not really the science Penn has a problem with. He's only copying the politically correct talking points because he thinks the solution is more government control. We'll see why they think that in part two. But in the rest of the world, conservatives have no problem accepting climate science and free market solutions. Even ten of the world's biggest oil and gas companies accept it. They say they're gearing themselves up for what they see as a huge transition into renewable energy. So what are these conservatives seeing that a lot of American conservatives aren't? I figured out long ago that humans work most efficiently when we're free to do what we like, so let me be a voice that both extremes may not have heard before, belonging to the majority of people who don't think scientific facts and a healthy environment and free enterprise are incompatible. Let me explain my thinking. In my 20s, I began to formulate my idea of a government-free society, which went like this. Imagine an island called Fredonia, not owned by any country. People in search of freedom staked their claim and settled there, and agreed on just one rule. Everyone has the freedom to do whatever he or she wants. Own guns, smoke dope, start a pig farm, anything. But of course, if someone starts a pig farm in his backyard, that could pollute the water his neighbours use for drinking. So the inhabitants of Fredonia had to come together again to qualify the rule. Everyone has the freedom to do whatever he or she wants, as long as it doesn't infringe on the freedom of others. So I have the freedom to dump garbage in the ocean from my private beach if I want to. But if that garbage ends up on my neighbour's private beach or affects the number of fish caught by an enterprising fisherman, then I'm infringing on their freedoms, their property rights and business rights. This is such a basic principle of conservatism. Why is it so many conservatives caught up in the climate debate have forgotten it? In the real world, when something impinges on people's freedom like this, society finds a way round it by setting targets to mitigate the problem, which encourages technological innovation and free market solutions. For example, when leaded gasoline infringed on a child's freedom to grow up without brain impairment, the solution wasn't to ban cars or claim the researchers were faking their data, it was to phase out lead in gasoline and let the free market come up with an alternative. Which, of course, it did. The same thing happened with CFCs used in aerosol sprays that were breaking down the ozone layer. There was a rather feeble attempt to discredit scientists and claim it was all a hoax, but society accepted the science and the free market came up with alternatives. The point is that none of these innovations would have come about if we'd taken the attitude of Ben Shapiro, that you only recognise a problem if someone first comes up with a solution. Free enterprise doesn't work like that. It's the other way round. Science recognises a problem, and then companies spend time and money coming up with a solution to fix it. As I said, I'll tackle these fears about plunging us back to the 1850s and greater government control in part two, but let's first look at a few other objections to the move towards CO2 reduction, starting with the President of the United States who thinks the Chinese government invented global warming in order to trick the US into spending billions of dollars fixing a problem that doesn't exist. 
Meanwhile, he says, the Chinese themselves are spending nothing, giving them a competitive edge. The reality is the polar opposite. First of all, clearly China didn't invent global warming. The link between CO2 and global temperature has been known about for 120 years. And far from doing nothing, China is now leading this energy revolution. For the last seven years, China has been the world's biggest producer and consumer of renewable energy. It's also the biggest investor in renewable energy research and manufacturing. In 2016, China accounted for more new solar thermal and onshore wind power than the United States and Europe put together. In 2017, it produced twice as much renewable power as the United States. Extremists on the left and on the right who claim this move to clean energy is incompatible with capitalism should try telling that to Chinese entrepreneurs like Huang Ming, a solar energy billionaire. He made his fortune manufacturing solar thermal tubes and built this huge research and manufacturing hub known as Solar Valley, south of Beijing. I spent three days here doing a profile on Huang Ming, and he was dismissive of the claims that capitalism is incompatible with good environmental practice. China is investing in renewable energy not to save the planet, but because it makes economic sense. Rising sea levels, a lack of water from glacial melt, increasing droughts and floods and stronger typhoons, regardless of whether POTUS thinks the Chinese made it all up, these things threaten China's future economic progress. And since the United States government has decided to opt out, China is more than happy to take the economic and technological lead in the energy revolution we're already seeing. So, ironically, the expenditure of billions of dollars in renewable energy that President Trump was worried would cripple U.S. factories is instead being spent in China, where factories are humming. Five of the world's six top solar panel manufacturers and five of the largest wind turbine manufacturers are now Chinese-owned. Their manufacturing drive and technological edge enables Chinese companies to sell solar panels, solar thermal tubes, batteries, electric bikes and wind turbines all over the world and dominate those markets. According to a report by the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, as the global transition towards renewables gains pace and as battery storage and electric vehicle technologies pick up momentum, China is setting itself to dominate these sectors globally over the next few decades of this century. Critics say these industries are only growing because renewable energy is subsidised. Without the subsidies, it would be uncompetitive. Well, of course, it is subsidised. That's the basic principle of Fredonia. When an industry does harm to the environment, it should be discouraged, and entrepreneurs should be encouraged to come up with solutions. It's no good arguing that if renewable energy was profitable, it would have happened without subsidies. The plain fact is it didn't, for the simple reason that for over a century we already had a profitable source of energy, coal and oil. If fossil fuels were producing electricity cheaper than solar panels and wind turbines, who in their right mind would want to switch to the latter as a source of energy or invest in it? But all you need to do to alter that balance is to take tax breaks away from the coal and oil industries and switch the money to the renewable power industry. All it takes is to make solar and wind marginally cheaper in some areas and all of a sudden you have a market. And once there's a market for a product, economies of scale kick in and the product gets cheaper still. And a market for a product means money is ploughed into research, making the product more efficient. As it gets cheaper, the subsidies can be lowered and eventually removed altogether. And that's exactly what's happened with wind and solar. Over the last 10 years, the cost of manufacturing solar panels and wind turbines has plunged, slashing the price of the electricity they produce. At the same time, their efficiency has increased, making them even more competitive. As the price falls, many countries have reduced or eliminated subsidies altogether. Electricity from renewables is now so cheap that even the Coal Museum in Virginia decided to install solar panels. 
According to a 2017 report by the International Renewable Energy Agency, increasingly the technology is competing head-to-head with conventional power sources and doing so without financial support. Objection number three comes from Alex Epstein, author of the book The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. This isn't exactly a newsflash, but the sun doesn't shine all the time. And the wind doesn't blow all the time. The only way for solar and wind to be truly useful would be if we could store them so that they would be available when we needed them. The windmills are wonderful, but you know, when the wind doesn't blow, they really do cause problems. (laughs) We have no energy this week. Well, hopefully the wind will start blowing pretty soon. It's hard to believe that this is the same nation that was once respected, even revered, for having a can-do attitude that built a railroad across a continent and put a man on the moon. When faced with a problem, past generations of Americans didn't just give up, they looked for solutions. American know-how and ingenuity was the envy of the world. These days, the attitude of, what can we do when the wind doesn't blow, means it's mostly other countries that are rolling up their sleeves and finding solutions. The intermittency problem doesn't just mean that sometimes you don't get any energy from wind and solar, it also means you sometimes get too much. Wind energy is so plentiful in China that when I was in Beijing a few years ago, the country had to shut down a third of its wind turbines in the north because it couldn't use all the electricity they were producing. And I discovered that this is commonplace. Germany sometimes produces so much electricity from renewables that the price falls to below zero. In other words, plant operators have to pay consumers to use it. So what's needed is an efficient way of storing this excess. You can store oil in a tank. Where do you store solar or wind energy? No such mass storage system exists. Which is like saying we need to get to the moon in a rocket, but we can't do it because no such rocket exists. Or, we have to build a railroad across America, uh, but it can't be done because there are mountains in the way. Come on, Americans, how far would the USA have got in the past with that attitude? If mass storage systems don't exist, roll up your sleeves and invent them. Then, hey presto, you get things that do exist, like this huge battery now feeding the grid in South Australia. Or in Wales, where excess electricity is pumped up to a reservoir, then runs back down through turbines when renewables don't perform. In Switzerland, compressed air is pumped into a sealed cave when there's too much electricity, and then released to drive turbines when there's not enough. Energy can be stored in flywheels, or as molten salt, which stays hot long enough to continue driving turbines for eight hours after the sun's gone down, long enough to meet peak demand. Some excess energy is used to split water molecules to produce hydrogen, which can be turned back into energy through combustion. Of course, you can whine and moan that some of these systems have problems, but you know what to do. Roll up your sleeves and find solutions. If you don't do it, your competitors will. For example, lithium-ion batteries are fine, but like everything else, they need to be made cheaper and more efficient. Last year, I went to a research institute in Taiwan to meet an engineer who did just that. The battery his team developed is made of aluminum, lighter, cheaper, and longer-lasting than lithium-ion batteries, and it can be recharged in just a few minutes. Another problem is that there's a shortage of places where water can be pumped into reservoirs. OK, find a solution to that too, like using heavy weights on rails instead of water. This system, by the way, was developed in the USA because some states are defying Washington's drive to go back to coal. If you haven't got the message by now, you won't find solutions to a problem by pretending the problem doesn't exist. And you won't do it by whining that the solution doesn't exist. And you won't do it either by blaming capitalism and demanding that we go back to living in caves. Environmental problems get solved by recognising a problem, setting common goals to eliminate it, and letting free enterprise and competition find the solution. In part two of this video, I'll look at how the Kyoto Protocol has fared. Did it bankrupt us, or did it actually succeed in reducing CO2 emissions? I'll talk about my visit to a carbon trading room. How's carbon trading different to a carbon tax? The Australian government wants to bring the economy to its knees. Say no to the carbon tax. And what happened to Australia when it first introduced and later dropped the carbon tax? 
And I'll have more on the exciting technological advances that are not only bringing us cleaner energy, but also more efficient energy use. Plus, how to take CO2 out of the air and sell it for a profit. But before I go, listen to this clip from President Carter when he inaugurated a solar water heater on the roof of the White House in 1979. A generation from now, this solar heater can either be a curiosity, a museum piece, an example of a road not taken, or it can be just a small part of one of the greatest and most exciting adventures ever undertaken by the American people. If America had embarked on that journey in 1979 instead of 1997, which is when the rest of the world started that journey after the Kyoto Protocol, we'd be 20 years ahead of where we are now. We would have had competitive solar and wind power by 1999, and today we'd already be seeing the drastic cuts in carbon dioxide that are planned for 2040. And it would be America, not China, with the technological lead, selling these products to the rest of the world. But when Ronald Reagan came to office, the White House solar water heater was taken down. Where is it now? Well, Carter's words were prophetic. A museum piece? An example of a road not taken? To be precise, it's in Huang Ming's Solar Museum in Solar Valley an example of the road America didn't take, and still won't take, but along which China is more than happy to lead the way.